it was a remodeling project and just waiting a little while that's going to be better, but that was a month ago, so it's time to talk. It's a remodeling project. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I had similar comments from a couple of uh, customers as well as former commissioners, so I, I didn't send him on his trip. I was like, I didn't. And so we should, we should address that. And we should ask those partners what's going on. Is this working? Ah, oh, now it's working. Okay. Okay. Well, that's easy. Test. Test. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I just very briefly want to uh, mention uh, that this morning I participated in a meeting with our uh, staff um, in uh, discussion of uh, our bonding plan for uh, the coming year uh, with Moody's, and uh, it, I, I thought we had a very positive uh, conversation and. Uh, the reaction from council uh, shortly after the meeting concluded was uh, was uh, indicative that it was in fact uh, positive. So, I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, our, our staff did a good job putting together the materials for for uh, for our our plan uh, for the coming years. And uh, um, hats off to them. So, Les, this may not sound uh, more a public service commission related, but it will be because. Uh, 
when I finish, you'll see why. On August 6th, there will be a ceremonial naming of the uh, Avenue, 15th Avenue North, in front of the Moorhead Armory to Bearcat Way, which is the name of the, the units that are at the Armory in Moorhead. The signs will go below the existing street signs. At 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, Mayor Williams will be there and offer a few remarks and we'll unveil the sign. All the commissioners will be invited. Uh, City Council will be invited, those who are ready to come out. Um, Clay County Commission and several other people, Representative Lee and Representative Marquardt have both indicated they will be there. I expect uh, Senator Eakin to be there as well. And how does this relate to Moorhead Public Service? Because under our event sponsorship, is that the title that yep. we use, event sponsorship, uh, MPS is contributing some money to the cost of the signs, which, by the way, were designed and printed by a Moorhead business. Thank you. I knew you'd tie that together, Les. Anything further? Bill. Uh, just a follow-up on uh, Commissioner Anderson's conversation about our Moody's call this morning. Uh, we do that basically every time we bond, and we don't bond that often. So it was 2012 was the last time we uh, uh, did a bond rating. Uh, actually, we do bond rating calls annually, don't we? Just kind of an update or every couple years? No? Was 2012 the last one? Okay. So 2012 was the last one, and, and in 2012 we were upgraded. Uh, to a double A3, which was very positive. So the, really the intent today was to maintain that rating. And uh, with the power plant uh, demolition costs and a, a little bit lower sales last year, that type of thing, we had a, we had a rougher uh, uh, financial year, but I think we uh, you know, helped allay their concerns about any of those types of things. And our main goal is to maintain that double A three rating and it sure felt positive at the end of the meeting so but really appreciate uh, Commissioner Anderson being there as well because uh, that was a good representation of the entire team uh, at Moore Public Service and I think it, it came across real well so appreciate that and that's all I had unless there's questions okay that brings us down to item 9 which is to approve the 2015 audited financial statements executive summary Federal Awards Report and I Bailey's management letter to the Commission. I don't who's going to speak to this. Please identify yourself when you get up there. Hi, I'm Lee Mitzen with I Bailey. Uh, is this mic on? Hello? There you go. Okay. Luke Evenson with I Bailey, uh, part of the audit team for Moorhead Public Service for the fiscal year of 2015, uh, which covers um, January 1st, 2015 to December 31st. Uh, today we'll be presenting just a short uh, summary of the audit and we'll go over a few of the financial ratios uh, which correspond to the financial statements. So if you guys want to open up to your executive summary, uh, looks like this on the front page if you have it in front of you. We have it electronically. Okay. Very good. Do we'll we have a copy for? Oh. I have copy? extra copies in the back if anybody needs okay. one. Go ahead. All righty. Well, I'll start with page one. Uh, we, we talk about the executive summary, and this is a summary of the audit. We pull together financial ratios, which, um, with the help of public service staff, to kind of create a picture of where the financial position is at the year end. So that's kind of the purpose of what I'm going to go over here in a second. Um, but as far as our audit, which is the main reason Ide Bailey is hired, is we're going to give an opinion on the financial statements. Uh, and during the fiscal year 2015, we had an unmodified opinion, which is clean. That's the quote unquote best audit opinion that you can receive. And I think, I don't know how many years in a row, but uh, every year since I've been on the audit, that's the opinion that's been given by us. Um, we also performed an audit on the federal funds that were expended uh, during the current year. Um, 
Morehead Public Service received a federal grant, and with that federal grant comes a single audit, and the, or the public service also received a clean audit opinion on that portion of the audit. So that's a tribute to uh, finance staff and internal controls that are in place uh, to receive that clean opinion. So with that being said, uh, we'll cover a little bit about the uh, finances, uh, starting with page two, if you want to page through with me. On page two, we'll look at Moorhead Public Service and the unrestricted cash as of December 31st for 2015 and the previous five years, sorry, previous four years. As you can see, unrestricted cash as of December 31st, 2015 is 3.7 million. Slightly below what it has been in the prior years, but along the similar lines where it was in 2014. And if you have any questions for me, I'll uh, certainly try to answer as we're going through. So starting then, we'll go to page three. Page three, we look at a ratio for days on cash for Moorhead Public Service for both the electric and the water fund. As you can see for the water fund, 110 days in cash is what we have here in the blue and 304 for the water fund. Now this ratio represents the number of days an organization can pay its expenses with the cash that's currently on hand. So, May I jump in for just? Go ahead. Just to, uh, we need a comment I, either from Bill or Nancy on that. Uh, we talked about it some this morning in our bonding conversation. I think it's important that we address uh, especially the electric uh, fund being down to 110 days. Our goal is uh, a little bit more ambitious than that. So, you know, if, if you could just, for the sake of uh, folks in the audience, maybe in particular, but um, but for the rest of the commission, just so we we have that uh, our target versus where we are in reality. Sure. Um, I would back up to page two for just a second there, and we looked at those cash balances um, when we talked about the $3.7 million in cash. That is just cash in our checking account. There are other um, investments and everything that we add on to that to get to our total unrestricted cash or our free cash. And so if we add those dollars onto there, we come up to about 14.2 million in, in unrestricted assets that are available through cash, through investments, and through our bond operation and maintenance funds. So a big or a good sized pool of money. Um, in 2015, we did use some of those reserves to do things like um, demo and remediate the power plant. Um, we used some of those reserves because sales were down significantly from budget. That sales for the year were down almost a million dollars. So we did use those reserves. Um, at the end of 2015, we've dropped down to about 100 and I think it was 104 days, the combined utility altogether. And what we talked about this morning with the bond rating agency was our need to replenish those over the next couple of years. And so we had already put together a plan that would bring us back up to our, or help us reach our goal of 170 days by 2019. So coming up in the budget cycle, the budget committee will see that we'll be proposing some slightly higher rate increases because we have expended some of those. So we need to do some recouping there. I, I don't think it's critical. That's what the reserves are there. They're for that to get us through those years where we have some expenses that were unplanned. And so I think we'll still be sitting in good shape through the bond rating, and we will address the issues at budget time and put together a plan that's um, palatable to our customers to help us do that. One question for me, so when we talk about 173, that's our goal. What's, what's the industry standard? Do you have that number? Is it around there or is it a little bit higher even? You know, for the AA rating, you know, so Moody's does ratings and they have different volumes, but the the AA rating that we strive to get into the, I think the guidelines were between 150 to 190, I think. So we've placed ourselves in the middle of that structure and that's where we would like to be, yep. to just be firmly within that category. Thanks. Any further questions for Nancy? All righty. Well, with that, I think we can move on to page four. Uh, page four, we'll just be looking at the electric fund uh, statement of net position, also known as the balance sheet. Uh, here we're going to look at the total assets in blue, which at the end of 2015 was $65.9 million. 
the total liabilities, which is the green, the lowest line, 24 million, and the total net position, 41.9 million in the red line. Uh, we saw a, a slight decrease uh, in that total assets and a slight increase in that total liabilities number. And as Nancy just alluded to, we saw a little bit of decrease in sales this year that could be attributable to that. So this is for just the electric fund. Uh, if we want to flip to the page five, we'll be looking at the water fund. Um, in 2015, you'll see some drastic changes in total assets. Uh, that blue line on top, 56.5 million, and a very, very large increase in 2015 in the green line, that total liabilities, 16.7 million this year. That increase, uh, both of those correlate with each other. Uh, with the increase in construction and progress and uh, I think it was the high service uh, pumping station uh, that we also took out debt for. So with that increase in assets, we saw that increase in liabilities and that's a correlation that we are looking for. So um, part, that's probably the main reason why those numbers are as they show on the graph. Moving on to page six. Now, page six, we'll look at liquidity. This is for MPS as a whole. Um, liquidity is a, uh, an ability to pay short-term financial obligations. Uh, so a higher number is, uh, means you are able to pay short-term financial obligations. Um, as you can see, 2015, we had a 0.84 uh, liquidity ratio, meaning that for every dollar in accounts payable or current liabilities, we had 84 cents. So if you look below the graph, the liquidity ratio uh, below 0.8 um, can lead to some negative uh, financial conditions. Uh, you guys are slightly above that. A lot of times we look for a 1.0 liquidity ratio and higher. Uh, you guys are slightly below. So. What a, what a ways to get the ratio up? It's probably a really dumb question, but I'll ask you anyway. We actually keep our investments in fairly short-term markets, so we've got a policy that dictates um, what we do invest those in, and they're usually government securities and things like that, too. So they are also fairly liquid, so if we look at those two together, um, you know, we would be at a good ratio. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind this number is just cash. We're not talking any investments that's included in this number. So uh, take take it for what you will. So it's not something we need to worry about? No, no. We've got good liquidity, liquidity in our investments also. Moving on to page seven. Uh, page seven, we look at long-term debt to total assets. And uh, liquidity is a measure of MPS's short-term solvency, which we looked at the previous page. Um, this looks at the long-term solvency uh, for long-term debt ratio. Um, this ratio also measures uh, MPS ability to pay this long-term debt. And if we look at the paragraph right, be right above the, uh, the graph here, a higher ratio is an indicator of declining ability to pay long-term debt. Um, Usually we want to see that at 0.5 or below MPS at uh, 0.23 for the fiscal year 2015. So there is the ability to pay for that long-term debt as we have the long-term assets. If we want to move to page eight uh, where we also talk about debt. This time we look at a debt service coverage ratio and this time we want a higher ratio as the debt service coverage <coughs> ratio determines the cash flow available to meet annual interest and principal payments on debt. So like I said, a higher ratio or above 1.0 is better. Uh, that means we have the available funds to pay for future principal and interest. For 2015, we see that number at 1.52. So there are, we are generating income uh, to pay for future debt obligations.
Moving on, we'll look at page nine. Uh, page nine, we look at the operations in the electric fund. Um, the operating revenues is that top blue line, 39.1 million. Operating expenses in the green at 28.9. And then operating income and transfers out the other two lines. Pretty consistent from the previous five, four years for 2015. Uh, not a lot of fluctuation here. However, if we turn the page and look at the expenditures for the electric fund, we look at it by category. Uh, in the categories of purchase power, distribution and transmission, depreciation and amortization, and administration, which is the smallest category, that is in purple. Once again, not a lot of fluctuation <coughs> here from the prior two years. Uh, moving on to page 11. Page 11, we look at the margins for the electric fund. We look at operating margin, which is operating income over the operating revenues, and the net margin, which is net income over the operating revenues. Um, one figure I would like to specifically point out is the green uh, net margin box for 2015, showing as a negative number. Um, this is due to two main reasons. Uh, one, implementation of GASB 68 uh, pension liability in the current year uh, that drastically reduced our, uh, our net income number in the current year and also due to the special item for the demolition costs uh, was another item that really attributed to that net income but weren't included in our operating income. So. Page 12, we look at the operations for the water fund. Operating revenues for the fiscal year 2015, 7.4 million. Operating expenses, 5.5 million. With an operating income of 1.8 million. And again, looking at the expenditures for the water fund on page 13 by category. We don't see very many significant changes, well-managed uh, you know, expenditures and monitored from year to year. So we don't have any major fluctuations that really affected our operating expenditures in the current year. And then finally, we look at the operating margin for just the water fund. Uh, once again, the operating margin in blue, the net margin in the green, um, we don't have as large of fluctuations as we showed in the electric fund, uh, pretty consistent from year to year here. Yes? Just a clarification on the city transfer. Yes. How is that reflected in the financials as far as uh, expense or where yep. is it categorized? So if we look at the, uh, you know, we were talking about operating margins and net margins, uh, it would not be included in our operating margins. That is not an operating expense. Um, it is what we call an other financing source, well, in this case, a use, since you, you spend it. Uh, but that would be included in our net margin. So if we're looking at our net income number, it's going to be included in that. But it's not going to be included in our operating expenditures. So. Any other questions? It would appear that you have abs absolutely no concerns about the operation of Mori Public Service. Is that accurate? Uh, as far as the audit goes, um, <laughs> as you can see, we gave uh, the best opinion that we could give. So uh, I've, uh, I'm qualified to speak on the audit, and we gave our, our the you know unmodified opinion. So I don't have a question as far as the material materiality of the financial statements. So good answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's also, uh, it speaks well, obviously, of our financial people and the job that they do here at Moore Public Service. And, and uh, for that, we thank them. Uh, are there any things, as you communicate this audit to us, are there any items 
that you believe should be brought to our attention whatsoever? Um, not that we already touched on. There was, a, there was actually probably three major new items that came up in the financial statements this year. Um, the demolition cost was a major item um, and having to expense those this year. Um, the GASB 68 net pension liability was a major item uh, as it was for all governmental entities this year. Um, and I believe the, uh, the was it the, the FERC receivable that we changed this year too? That was a newer item this year? Yeah, the, our receivable from Southwest Power Pool, you know, went into effect in October of 2015. And before the end of the year, as we negotiated that with FERC, the, the original receivable and the revenue we put on the book was higher. Um, it was our original filing, and that has since been reduced. So the, the expected outcome of that is recorded in the last quarter of 2015. So we should see a change in next year's audit in terms of these relationships with, with the margins. You'll see, yeah, we did um, budget in 2016 the higher amount. So you'll see that we're, we're going to run short of that original expectation by over a million dollars in 2016 so our our reimbursement is significantly less than we anticipated at budget time so the 2015 financials reflect the new correct yes. amount 2016 we'll still be seeing that million dollar plus shortage in 2016. Yep. anybody have any questions could i have a motion please concerning the approval of the audit statement so moved is there a second second all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the same sign. Thank you very much. And thank you, staff, Thanks. for a job well done. Yeah, Nancy and Mark do an excellent job in taking care of our finances, as you can see from the audit. And uh, they do put in a lot of time on this, so they did a good job. Appreciate them. I see that brings us down to the close of the meeting. We're not going into executive session, I'm assuming. No. Uh, later this evening, around 6 o'clock, we'll be meeting with the uh, residents of the Oakport area to discuss with them the takeover of the uh, Red River Valley Cooperative situation. Is there anything further that anybody wants to bring up for the good of the order? Did you need any, uh, you know, just any preliminary discussion on what's going to take place at that meeting? Well, uh, that might be a good idea. Just, you know, we have uh, basically three parts that we're going to talk about. We're going to leave the dual fuel till the end. So the, the three parts are going to be basically we're going to talk about the transfer of electric service for these approximately 350 uh, customers. And then, uh, you know, go over all those details. And I would expect that there's going to be concerns about, you know, when's it going to happen? Uh, what can I expect? Who's going to be in my backyard changing meters, that type of thing? And then, uh, I think street lighting will come up. Street lighting comes up every time we've had one of these meetings, so we're going to explain street lighting. We'll talk about the uh, the feeder that we're putting up there and and how that's going to work. Um, you know, there might be again on part one the transfer, kind of the general stuff. There could be discussion about the surcharge. I would uh, guess that they would probably ask about that. That's been in the agreement for over 25 years so i mean it's nothing that's unexpected to anybody uh, but i i'll explain that if uh, if there's questions i may not bring that up and offer it but i'm guessing that there's probably going to be a, a question on that if i if i may make a suggestion i think we should not call it a sur surcharge because that makes it sound like we're going to charge more than they're currently being charged it's maybe it's a rate differential because the the customers will pay less than they currently are paying correct Yes. They will pay less than what they're currently paying. Yeah. Um, it is technically than, called than, a surcharge, know, so it'd be kind of tough not to call it a surcharge. But yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll try and be sensitive to that question. I mean, but it is a rate differential. Yeah. Um, it'll be less than what uh, they're currently paying, which is the positive. It's more than what Moorhead residents are paying, um, which, you know, they can look at it either as a glass half empty or glass half full. Um, but there is significant investment we're making in the system and, uh, you know, it's probably appropriate for them to pay their uh, portion of that. And in the negotiated agreement, which President Norman was a big part of, uh, you know, that was in the agreement. So uh, we're just following what was in the agreement. 
Um, but anyway, that's some of the issues that you know could come up in the meeting tonight. Um, part two is the just an overview of the dual fuel program. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about how the dual fuel system works in Moorhead, and then talk about capture the sun, uh, thrifty watts, some of our other programs that we have, just to introduce them to Moorhead Public Service. Um, and introducing them to more in public service, they are Red River Valley Cooperative Power customers, and Lauren Brorby, the CEO, will be in the audience. He's not going to say anything, doesn't want to say anything, but will answer questions if there's questions, and he's very good at answering questions, so uh, we've gone over. He's reviewed all these things. You've seen that he's been, on, he's been in the joint letter that we've sent to all these customers and everything, so, uh, and he's taken a few calls in anticipation of this meeting. We have as well. Um, so part two is just that overview of the dual fuel program and other programs. Uh, part three then, and really at this time I may say if you don't have dual fuel you can leave if you care to. Um, I'm expecting people to stay and just listen. But uh, about 150 of the 350 people have dual fuel systems. And so there's going to be probably, I'm sure, some questions. I'll do an overview of the incentive the special offer that the commission has, you know, 80% of the conversion up to $2,000 of the conversion. And that really should handle everybody's conversion. Uh, they'll have to pay 20% of the conversion, so they'll have to want to do it. Um, Dennis Eisenbrown and I this afternoon were actually up in Oakport looking at one conversion or uh, possible conversion. And uh, so it was kind of a nice uh, thing to do the, the afternoon before this meeting. Um, so I mean, I, we kind of are aware of some of the questions. Basically, what we're going to be saying is, you know, we're giving the incentive, and it's a generous incentive. And people are looking at it as a, wow, 80%. You're paying 80% of this. Uh, Lauren Burby said that too. Wow, that's that's good. Lauren Wood. Yeah, Lauren Wood. And uh, so. But what we're going to do is we're going to stick pretty tight to our rules and regulations. And we've learned that from past acquisitions that, you know, we want our employees to have a standardized system out there. We want the meters outside. And in order to get that, we're willing to pay to do that. And so um, Red River is actually going to go in earlier this summer for the meters that are dual fuel meters because they don't have an air conditioner incentive like we do for controlling the air conditioners. So they're not using that second meter right now. So they're actually gonna take that meter out before we do the, the switch over. And they're just gonna put a blank you know, cover on that. And that'll just stay the way it is. And that actually, if, if people don't take the incentive, don't wanna be on our dual system, they, that can just live just the way that is. So no cost to the homeowner to just leave it as is. If they want to convert to the dual fuel system, we will pay 80% of that. They have to get an electrician or they have to be qualified in order to do it, you know, the work. And then uh, there'll be questions. And that's where we'll get into a number of very specific questions in which we're gonna, we're gonna try and give very general answers and then say we'll, we'll talk to you about the specifics either after the meeting or whatever, so. Ralph? Uh, and one thing I think we should uh, stress as well is we want to go underground, right? So we want to make sure that people understand the goal is to get all the stuff underground if we can. I know we have easements, some we do, some we don't, some is underground, some is not, but I think we should, again, push that with everybody to understand, you know, for reliability reasons, we want to go and not put an overground system or above ground system. Yeah, I can talk about that probably under part one. Our system will be all underground. Red River's system is pretty much underground. Um, Are we able to go all underground? Do we well, have we're not. Easements? The services were not. I mean, I don't know, if, Travis. Did you want to kind of give a Maybe broad you can fill us in on overview of that? Up there, Travis. Uh, Travis Schmidt, electrical engineering manager. So the the plan that we have is is to avoid the major outages with the feeder lines and the distribution lines out there. So pretty much all of that will be placed underground, except for a few areas where. Um, we'll manage those as we have to and take care of them in the future. Um, the, all the services from the transformer to the house or to the meter socket, those, if they're overhead, they'll stay overhead. If they're underground, um, they'll stay underground. If a person wants to um, 
convert their service to underground, we have stuff in our rules and regulations that will take care of that as well too. So who would pay for that? The, the, the undergrounding of the service. Yep. So MPS will pay for the wire or provide the wire to do the service um, conversion, but the homeowner will have to hire an electrician to convert the service and put the wire in underground. Good question. That could be one of the, because I mean, that's a specific of the conversion and I'm going to do exactly what I just did there and I'm going to call Travis up to the mic if some of those questions are, because I want the right answers. I want to, you know, we've worked all these things out and want to give them that as good. That is the chairman's cell phone going off right yeah. now. <laughs> I'm going to point that out here. What a brilliant deduction that was. Yeah. Um, we do have handouts, et cetera. I mean, we've got dual fuel packets that they all received in the mail, along with a letter that I'll go over this letter that talks about the incentive. And then, so there could be a number of questions about the program specifically, and then the conversion. So the first third of the meeting is talking about the electric service, reliability, underground overhead, that type of thing. The last two thirds of the uh, meeting, I believe, will be on dual fuel. And that's what we heard from Lauren Brorby in our meetings as we were negotiating the... What are you, what are you finding for a conversion cost to the consumer? If you said you're out there today looking at a, a new system going in, what, what is it costing per household? We don't know yet. I mean, we talked with electricians beforehand, and I think... Well, everything's the, going to be different. Um, yeah, and a majority of them are going to be able to do it for... We're paying up to 1,600, 80% of 2,000. So, but we don't have any experience yet. We may hear a little bit of that tonight because they may have already talked to their electrician and said, you know, you could get somebody that comes in and says, it's going to cost me 2,500. And we can look at those on a case by case basis. I mean, you know, that's, uh, there may be, the one that we went to this afternoon is a, is a geothermal, um, you know, system in a home. And, uh, you know, Dennis and I went over all the details. It really isn't, it, we don't have any in the city of Moorhead. So, I mean, it isn't really in here. Heat pumps are in here, but not geothermal heat pumps, and they operate differently. So we were learning about the operation of a geothermal heat pump. And, uh, well, at you know, one point it, in time, they were encouraging people to invest in those. Right. The interesting thing is that they really don't need to be on our dual fuel system because they basically don't use much energy. So it, it doesn't really pay for us to make a big investment. It doesn't pay for them to make a big investment. So it may be just that it just goes on the regular meter and it's going to be just fine. Um, you know, and that's some of the things that there's a little bit of individual attention that's going to be needed. Uh, so tonight will be the general conversation, and then uh, uh, there'll be a lot of talking. Have you had any comments from customers to this point? You know, I have had just a couple, not, uh, I haven't had a lot. I mean, I've heard Lauren said he had a, a couple of people, but mainly it was, should I go to this meeting or not? You know, so I mean, I, I'm not even sure how many people we'll have here tonight. We sent a lot of information out. I mean, Dennis, you've been getting... A number. I mean, but they've been all dual fuel. Here, why don't you come up? Why don't you come up? Uh, Dennis Eisenbrown, Energy Services Manager. Yes, I've been fielding calls from uh, mostly dual uh, customers, Smokeport, and most of them have been pretty generic kind of questions about the conversion and. Uh, you know what they need to do, what they ex what they can expect, but <clears throat> some of the comments I've gotten just generally have been that that have been very positive about coming into the Moorhead system uh, as electric, and uh, some of them are really excited about that. Actually, I, I was surprised I got those comments, but uh, they uh, nobody I uh, didn't get any negative comments yet. Okay, were they aware that the cost might be four hundred dollars to them on the conversion? Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they they understood that. I mean, most of the people I've talked to have been really just pretty what I call level-headed and, and just uh, pretty reasonable. Kind of understood what was coming and uh, not any great big surprises. So, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? 
or okay. anybody else have any comments that they've heard at all? No? Well, we want to make sure that our customers yeah. are happy, even our, and our, especially yeah. our new customers. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the calls I've gotten, I'm sorry, uh, but it, yeah, you know, I, there haven't been any of those, you know, you know, there's a call coming in, you go, oh, no, it's going to be an old port customer. I haven't gotten any of that at all. They've, they've been really very, very positive, so, surprisingly so. Mm -hmm. So, you got a question? After you're done. So where are we at in terms of installation? Well, some people have, I'm sorry. Installation? Or are you you're talking, talking about, about the fuel system? Fuel or electric? Electric in general. Okay, I'll turn that over to Joe because I'm. Yeah, I, I thought Joe should report. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Joe Moore, Electric Operations Manager. Um, I would say we started out from, we had a point last year up just north of the B plant where we took off from, and we're all the way up to 53rd or the first couple tie in points with the main feeder. And actually, we're beyond that. We're heading up towards Wall Street. So in terms of the places where we tie in, we, of, the, of the places we tie in, we're probably half, close to half a third to half, ready to tie in. We can't tie in until we actually do the changeover, mm -hmm. but we can have it ready. So it's been going not too bad with the delay we had. Um, not bad. Hopefully, we'll see what the next month does. Okay. That'll be a good determining factor. Ralph? So when we tie in, will there be any disruption of service, or is it just it gets a loop? Doesn't it? There is a loop there. Um, depending upon how the phasing goes together, we'll have to make sure the rotation. There's some three phase up there, so not to get too deep into it, but make things turn the correct way. Um, hopefully, we can tie in, and and uh, the voltages are match each other. So as long as as the subs don't fight each other from the other systems, <laughs> it shouldn't be too bad. Yeah. How did the substation fare with all this rain? Uh, everything was good. So we, we had uh, several, the guys worked through the night, uh, probably two days uh, with uh, tree branches and things like that. But as far as the circuits and everything, it uh, held up really well. Actually, I meant the substation that flooded a couple of years ago. How did that? We're happen? good. We're good there. We're good? <laughs> Making sure. I have one more question. Do you have a question? I have one more question. Okay. So how are we doing with XL? Um, XL, we really haven't had a lot of conversations with them since the last time. Um, they have started on their process internally to take a look at things. And I'm expecting that they're going to want to meet here probably this fall. Um, I'm not sure who their lead negotiator is going to be, if that's going to be somebody out of the Twin Cities, their attorney, per se. But I think they have somebody that's experienced with these things. The big question is going to be, you know, are they going to want to ask for as much as, you know, the cooperative is going to ask for? They've generally been very reasonable um, in the past. So we've worked with them really well on that, uh, yeah, the distribution line for a few homes, and they worked really well together with us. So we don't expect any, any big issues with them. But that would be a total replace, right, from, a, from an equipment standpoint? Yeah. Okay. That was an question. And I didn't, I didn't say the time frame. I mean, we're still looking at right around early part of October for the, the changeover. So. Okay. I'm not allowed to any, ask any more questions. Oh, is that right? You can. Dave. <laughs> Dave wants to ask a question. Actually, I'd, I'd like to ask for something. Um, I'd, uh, I think it would be a good idea if we had a driver on. To take take us up to the to the old port area. It's called a grid tour. And, and just just show us show us the work. This this is. I'd really like to get an this idea. This is commonly of, referred to as a grid tour. A grid tour. Well, this is a part of the grid tour. But I, I'd really like to take a look. Feel free anytime. Yeah. Well, we have. Well, I think he's talking about a getting a bus and doing yeah, a tour like we have in the past, and maybe inviting some members of the city council. I know I can get our new right our new manager, uh, <laughs> so he can familiarize himself with what what we do and where we do it. We were talking about doing that anyway, weren't we, this fall? Um, we're going to do an open house this fall in the high service pump station, you know, that big investment we made on the water side, and the capture of the sun, you know, we'll do another ribbon cutting for our next phase. Uh, I think that's probably what we were talking about. But, yeah, a grid tour would probably be best this summer. Well, I thought we were actually talking about going out and looking at the water resources as well. Yeah, I don't know if we looked at 
doing that, but we could, yeah. Yeah, it's not hard. I mean, the. I don't know that everybody has been out and taken a look. Go ahead. And we should be familiar. Yeah. And I agree, especially on the water side, with, with the decision coming up on the water supply, I think yeah. it would be good for us to understand where what is and where the future stuff could be. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good idea. And, and I think it would be nice, uh, Chuck, if some of the members of the council would also go out there to realize how massive this undertaking is. That we, and it would, it's all your fault. <laughs> yeah, we'll blame Chuck. Yeah, blame Chuck. Anything further right now? John? As uh, like just a clarification, they will have representation from Ward one. One. 1, which is Mr. Norman. So I don't know if he has an understanding as issues or concerns to be brought up, if they should contact who, a good or idea. do we need to have a, a an, another, maybe not representative, but somebody who they would have a contact person. So, so that, would that should be, be explained. Yeah, that's yep. a good idea. Yep. And if he's not available, you or whoever could probably answer the question correctly yep. for them. As opposed to my answer, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that. Let me. I heard that. It was there. It was there. Anything further? Okay. This meeting is adjourned.